Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes in detail. Right now, get scary good deals on select ring cameras and doorbells. See who's there. Keep your scaredy cats company. Oh, it's okay, sweetie. I'll be home soon. And protect your crypt from the real monsters. Oh, come on. The sign says take one. Save big on select ring devices right now at ring.com. This episode is brought to you by LifeLock. During Cybersecurity Awareness Month, LifeLock wants to give you helpful tips to protect your identity. Using multi-factor authentication can be a line of defense to help protect your personal information, like getting a text with a security code. But LifeLock offers comprehensive protection against identity theft. Protect your identity today with a 30-day free trial at LifeLock.com slash podcast. If you were involved in conservative politics in the early 2000s, one name that kept coming up again and again at both the federal and provincial level in Alberta is Ted Morton. Hello, my name is Brian Lilly, and this is the Full Comment Podcast. And today we're going to talk to Ted Morton about his new book, Strong and Free, My Journey in Alberta Politics. It's just come out. Uh, but Ted, uh, th first off, thanks for the book. Thanks for coming on. But I actually want to start somewhere else. Uh, and that is with something else that you helped write a long time ago. It's part of what you talk about in the book. But you're famous as one of the authors for the firewall letter. Um, you know, something that you wrote with Stephen Harper and Tom Flanagan. Uh, something that is now looks like it might be coming to fruition. So how does that feel so many years later, hearing some of the things that you advocated for being looked at a serious policy in the Alberta government. I mean, you were in government for a long time and some of that couldn't happen, but your idea is now coming to fruition. That must feel good. It feel, feels very good, very gratified. Yes, yeah, Stephen Harper, I, and several others uh, in 2001 wrote the Alberta Agenda, aka Firewall Letter. Uh, we were, it looked like the Senate reform thing was going to go flat. So if we couldn't get more Alberta in Ottawa, which was the purpose of Senate reform, we wanted uh, less uh, less Ottawa in Alberta. And those were the firewall agendas. I spent uh, about a decade and a half fighting for that in provincial politics unsuccessfully, led to the uh, division of the two conservative parties and election of an NDP government in 2015. But uh, Jason Kenney was able to achieve what I failed to achieve uh, in 2018. Jason got the uh, <clears throat> the uh, Wild Rose Party and the PCs to come together, won a majority government, and now Danielle has done that again. And both of those, both uh, Premier Kenney and now Premier Smith, have taken those firewall policies and put them into practice uh, or, or are moving them towards practice as government policy. Well, e even the way that you described it and the way that I described it, you called it by its proper name, the Alberta Agenda, and I'm one of those Eastern bastards. Is is that what you call it? I think I've got a book <laughs> around here called that. Uh, you know, so I called it the firewall letter. Talk to me a little bit about uh, what the main thrust of uh, the Alberta Agenda was, because it gets vilified in much of Canada. And even though I am an Eastern bastard, I've always looked at the Alberta uh, agenda and the firewall letter and said, why are people outraged that Alberta wants what Quebec has or what most of Ontario has? That has never made sense to me. So what, what was in it um, in, in why were you pushing for those things? Well, again, uh, to have more control of what happens policy-wise and policy implementation-wise uh, inside of Alberta. And as you've correctly pointed out, uh, the firewall, 
well, let's backtrack. What, what is a firewall? A firewall is a, an internet uh, software firm. It keeps out unwanted <laughs> interference in, uh, in your, uh, your, your IT base. And so there's nothing particularly controversial about a firewall. And the things that we proposed, uh, policing, a provincial police force rather than the RCMP, uh, collecting our own taxes, uh, uh, having an Alberta pension plan, withdrawing from the Canada pension plan. Quebec does all of those. Ontario does several of those. So it's not uh, a- We have the on- Ontario provincial police. I passed by officers with the OPP. Coming into the Ontario legislature today for this interview, um, Quebec has the SQ, the Sûreté de Quebec, provincial police force. And Alberta, Alberta did in the 30s. And at one point, Alberta had its own police force and then and then opted to rent uh, the RCMP starting, I think, in the 40s. Yeah. Well, I mean, what benefit does it to say, well, the RCMP has to do highway patrol outside of Tabor? Um, and, and if not, the nation will crumble. I, I don't understand that that thinking. Well, I, again, to, to kind of bridge to another another issue that's problematic in Alberta. Of course, if you want if you want to go forward in the RCMP, you better be bilingual, right? Any federal bureaucracy uh, to move up up the hierarchy, you have to the higher you go, the more bilingual you have to become. Uh, how, I think six percent of six percent of Albertans are bilingual, uh, and if you want to move up the RCMP uh, ladder, you also have to be willing to move around in different provinces. And there are a lot of young men and women in uh, Alberta who are not bilingual and who want to stay in Alberta and uh, therefore, but don't, don't pursue uh, policing opportunities, at least with the RCMP. If we had a provincial police force, uh, I think you'd see uh, a lot more capable young uh, Alberta men and women uh, thinking about joining. The, the Quebec pension plan um, is often used in a very political way, and your mileage may vary on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, Quebecers will often take pride that their pension money is used uh, for propping up Quebec companies' favorite industries. If if you had your way and Alberta had their pension plan tomorrow, what would you be doing? Would it be just like the Quebec model where uh, politically, they decide we need to invest in this sector and therefore uh, we'll put money in, whether it's a good return or not, or should it be more like the Canada Pension Plan, very hands-off, sometimes too hands-off. Right now, they're spending a huge amount of money building a uh, a beautiful office in downtown Toronto that uh, you know is mind-boggling, that it, the money they're paying for that. What would you do? What would your vision be? Uh, on, a, on a high level, I'm in favor of uh, fences around whether it's a, a provincial pension plan or in the case of the Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund. Uh, as I document repeatedly in the book that's coming out, comes out today, uh, not just the conservative government, the NDP government, uh, all governments uh, in Alberta can't resist the temptation, and not just in Alberta, uh, everywhere, to do short term spending for short-term political objectives rather than long-term uh, economically sensible and uh, well-advised types of uh, investments. So certainly at a high level, I would favor the, uh, the offense around to keep political influence to a minimum. Yeah. Um, that, that's the model I favor just right now. Uh, as I say, perhaps a bit too independent when you're going to, I believe it's, tens of millions of dollars on their their new offices with features that you would get from a Wall Street hedge fund. Uh, and, they're, and, and by the way, the Canada pension plan is not outperforming the markets in any significant way. We're just paying a lot for our pension plan. Uh, so do you think that, I know that uh, there's been some polling that shows it's not a super popular idea. Um, do you think that Premier Smith will move forward with this? Uh, there's a study underway, an independent arm's length study about uh, the uh, nature and size of uh, Alberta's contribution to the CPP. Uh, when that comes back, obviously there'll be more discussion. People are understandably nervous about, uh, there are a lot of people, including me, <laughs> who get a Canada pension plan check every month. And uh, so they're nervous. And I, I, I understand, and obviously you understand too, why people are nervous about politicians putting their hands on uh, 
things like uh, your pension checks. But uh, I think properly explained and with, as I said, the political fences around it to keep to prevent short term uh, to let governments, not just the Smith government, gov- but governments down the road uh, using a, a Alberta pension plan for their own short term political purposes rather than longer term sound investment purposes. I think people can be persuaded. You took a, a long and interesting route to be someone who spent 30 years in Alberta politics. Um, first off, you're originally from L.A., uh, and then you end up in Alberta. Did you lose a bet? You're kind of the, <laughs> Actually, kind of the opposite left, of Gretzky. <laughs> I, left, I, I left L.A. Uh, when I was three years old. I grew up in Wyoming, yeah. which, again, if you've traveled a little bit, you know, Wyoming, Montana, Alberta have a, share a lot in common. Uh, Wyoming and certainly Casper, Wyoming, where I grew up was an oil and gas town. Uh, and in the old days, uh, before big jets, when you still had DC threes, whatever they were called, the flights from, uh, Houston, Dallas, Denver, Casper, Billings, right up, right up to Calgary. So I had friend. we knew people and, and I went to school with kids that were coming and going to Calgary already. So for me to end up in Calgary and in Alberta was, uh, not that much of a stretch. And plus, as, as you and I've already mentioned, I spent uh, four and a half years in Toronto where I did my PhD at the University of Toronto. So I was I knew Canada and uh, I knew enough about Alberta to be comfortable there. I, I once uh, interviewed uh, one of the more famous people to come out of uh, Wyoming, Dick Cheney. Uh, and, and there's a man who also knew Canada very well. And what was fascinating about him was finding out that He'd fished in every part of this country and had gone coast to coast and knew parts of Canada better than a lot of Canadians do, had explored it more. So, um, yeah, I have just, uh, you know, driven through the, all of that area. It's absolutely gorgeous. And you're right, a lot of, of connections back and forth. But when you uh, ended up moving to Canada, did you think that you would be so deeply involved in provincial and national politics? Absolutely not. I, the reason I went to the University of Toronto was because there was a a, a person uh, in the U of T philosophy department, Emil Fackenheim, who was the leading Hegel scholar in North America, and I wanted to do a PhD on uh, on Hegel, the German philosopher. So that's why I came to Toronto. And uh, like most graduate students, what I hoped is that I'd finish in in three or four years, and I did. And then I'd get a job. But given the academic job market, you had to be willing to go where, where the jobs happen, open. So going to Toronto was very intentional. Uh, what was going to be next? I had no idea. And, and so you went from U of T to where? I, had, I left U of T in 78, and I taught at a small Catholic college in Boston for three years. The year I left U of T, one of my best friends from graduate school days, Reiner Knopf, uh, who's from out from from Ontario and who was in the same programs I was in at U of T. I went to Boston. He went he went to uh, Calgary. And three years later, 1981, he phoned me up. And he said, Ted, uh, you Alberta's growing. You have University of Calgary is growing. Our department's growing. We need somebody to come here and teach American politics and Canadian constitutional law. And I'd done part of my Ph.D. was on Canadian constitutional law. So uh, I flew out got the interview, was offered the job, and uh, had to spend a little bit of time persuading my wife that she'd like uh, the Western, <laughs> Western, Western from, Canada. From Boston to Calgary, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but it, and Calgary has grown tremendously since then. Very much. Uh, when, we, when we moved to Calgary, it was 600,000 people. Today, I think it's 1.2, 1.3 million. So it's, it's more yeah. than double. Uh, so looking back... Uh, from when you first got involved to now, um, and I and I know you you know go over various uh, policies in your book. Where have you changed your mind? Were, were there things that you were steadfast in thirty years ago that now you say mm, I'd take a different approach or I wouldn't be as as strident? Good question, uh, but one that I've never thought of before trying to think. Um, The only thing that comes immediately to mind was I was very much opposed to the decriminalization of marijuana. Uh, Because like a lot of 
kids who were in college and university in the 60s, I smoked a lot of marijuana. Uh, I stopped uh, once I got to Toronto and once I had kids, and then especially once I had a job, I wasn't going to do something that was illegal. And uh, But I have friends that kept smoking, uh, and they still they smoke through their 20s, 30s, 40s. And I think they've lived much smaller lives than they were capable of. So I was against decriminalizing marijuana. But I, over time in Calgary, I developed friends with uh, policemen, uh, uh, several, who said, Ted, uh, it's so widespread. It's, uh, we're wasting our time chasing people over marijuana. We need to get marijuana off, off the, the crime list and move on to the, much, to the more serious drugs. So I was persuaded there based on advice and uh, conversations with friends who are actual policemen to change my mind on that. We need to take a, a quick break for uh, for some commercials to pay the bills. But when we come back, I do want to ask you about um, the Triple E Senate. Uh, that dream seems to be dead, but there's also been some recent uh, Senate appointments that mm, kind of annoying, more than a few Albertans. More when we come back. This episode is brought to you by LifeLock. During Cybersecurity Awareness Month, LifeLock wants to give you helpful tips to protect your identity. Using multi-factor authentication can be a line of defense to help protect your personal information, like getting a text with a security code. But LifeLock offers comprehensive protection against identity theft. Protect your identity today with a 30-day free trial at LifeLock.com slash podcast. Oh, it's such a clutch off-season pickup, Dave. I was worried we'd bring back the same team. I meant those blackout motorized shades. Blinds.com made it crazy affordable to replace our old blinds. Hard to install? No, it's easy. I installed these and then got some from my mom. She talked to a design consultant for free and scheduled a professional measure and install. Hall of Fame son. They're the number one online retailer of custom window coverings in the world. Blinds.com is the GOAT. Shop Blinds.com's primetime kickoff event. Save up to 50% off select styles, plus doorbusters. Rules and restrictions may apply. Ted, one of the issues that you uh, pushed for in your early days, or not early days, but uh, 25 or so years ago, was Tripoli Senate. I, I think that ship is, um, if it hasn't passed, it's definitely uh, parked, it's mooring, uh, it's not really going anywhere. Recently, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau uh, appointed two senators from Alberta. Now, you've got three senators in waiting who've been elected by the people of Alberta, and Yet he did not appoint any of them and inst instead appointed Daryl uh, Fridhandler. He's a lawyer who has a very long track record of donating to the Liberal Party and organizing and be being on committees. Very long. And yes. then yes. academic activist Christopher Wells. I, that must have been a slap in the face. A a absolutely. And uh, But Senate reform, in theory, makes good sense. It's how in other federal states, not just the U.S., but Australia, Germany, uh, the less populated uh, regions and states can articulate and defend their interest in a national legislative policymaking arena where most of the other power is based on represent representation by population, right? And uh, case in point, uh, my I arrived in Alberta just when Trudeau number one, Pierre Trudeau, brought in the National Energy uh, Program, which devastated... Uh, devastated Alberta uh, economically, chased uh, billions of dollars of uh, oil and gas investment south of the border. Uh, and he did that because it was very popular in, uh, in Eastern Canada. It kept pr gas prices and heating prices lower. In the U.S., the uh, representatives in the House of Representatives brought in identical legislation bills in the House of Representatives, and it passed. But when it went to the Senate, in the Senate, the bill goes to a committee, Natural Resource Committee, goes to a subcommittee. Who sits on those committees? The senators from Texas, Louisiana, Colorado, Wyoming, the oil and gas producing states had never made it out of committee. So there's a very graphic example of how um, a Tripoli Senate could and would articulate and allow Western Canada and the Maritimes to articulate and defend regional interests that are not shared by Ontario and Quebec. But it's not going to happen, and I, as far as I'm concerned, I'm on complete, completely on the abolition ticket now for the Senate. Uh, which would also be incredibly um, problematic, because as you mentioned, the Supreme Court decision in 2014, I don't think people 
realize the impact of that decision. I mean, Stephen Harper just abandoned um, any attempt to alter or change the Senate. He abandoned appointing senators. I think that's probably something that if we were having a frank conversation with the former prime minister today, he would say was probably a mistake, leaving all those appointments open. Uh, Danielle Smith had an interesting uh, musing the other day and created some controversy in Alberta. She was talking about increasing the population, doubling the population of the province dramatically in order to make sure that Alberta does have more clout, um, more population, more clout, like Ontario and Quebec. Um, some people are supportive. Others were saying, are you crazy? Uh, immigration, strangely under Justin Trudeau, has become a, a hot button issue and is not quite uh, looked on quite as fondly as it was. What did you make of, of her position on that? Uh, again, she, she's right in theory, but in practice, I don't think uh, none of that's going to happen too quickly. Uh, Im immigration, uh, population grows through immigration, both uh, immigration from the rest of Canada and immigration from, from outside. Uh, it, 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 this year, uh, Canada, or Alberta, I think, has already taken on an additional 200,000 new people in, in just this year. But still, in terms of Quebec and Ontario have uh, 199 MPs, 199 MPs in the House of Commons. The majority is uh, 170. Uh, it'll be a long time before the population of Alberta or Saskatchewan are, are anywhere even close to that uh, in terms of uh, representation in the in the uh, House of Commons. So long term, maybe, but it, short term, it, it doesn't address much more pressing issues. And that's why she's on the pro on the uh, Sovereignty Act which addresses short-term, immediate and short-term issues of, of importance to Alberta. Do you think the Sovereignty Act would survive a court challenge? Uh, the act in the abstract does. Again, like a lot of policy, it depends on the specifics of how it's used in specific instances. But they've been uh, very clear that uh, under the Sovereignty Act, no individual and no private company, no corporation is going to be asked to uh, violate any law, provincial or federal. Uh, so uh, they've blocked off that liability, uh, that risk. Uh, and then again, depend, depends on how they use it. I think what the Sovereignty Act does, instead of Alberta challenging federal laws under the Sovereignty Act, suddenly uh, Alberta is going to play offense and, uh, and it's going to be Ottawa that has to challenge, which is a lot. Well, and frankly, the model for that is Quebec. Mm -hmm. Playing offense rather than defense. As, as someone who um, was there at the beginning with Preston Manning building the reform movement, like your sense on how you think uh, federal conservative politics is going now. Uh, you get some people who you know pine for uh, uh, you know a vision of the old progressive conservative party that I don't think is attached to reality. You know Brian Mulroney. Uh, he, we ran he ran on his platform today uh would be to, you know that would be described as far right and horrible and uh, regressive and that's how they described him back in the day but some people think oh no it's a much more genteel party it's different and so uh they view pierre polyev's conservatives as well that's just reform and they're so far right others will say he's not a real conservative he's not being hard enough where, what's your sense of where Polyev is where the the conservative movement is federally compared to what you were were fighting for with with Manning. Well, uh, the tensions are obviously there. They were there then, uh, Manning versus the federal conservatives, and they're there today, as you just described. But what are the what do the polls say about Pierre Polyev and the uh, conservative party of uh, of, uh, of Canada that they they're ahead in the polls by close to twenty percent, and they. If there's an election, if things don't change before the next election, they could win uh, as many as 200 seats uh, in the House of Commons. So uh, I would say at that level, uh, the Conservative Party today is uh, quite successful. And again, I, th I think you know, but your your listeners may not. Uh, I've known uh, Pierre probably ever since he was a student at U of C in the, in the 1990s and uh, I liked him then. I like him now. Uh, and I think Canadians 
now given the choice, prefer him to uh, Justin Trudeau. Uh, so, so you're saying that his uh, uh, political formation took place at the Calgary School, as you and several of your colleagues have been dubbed over the years. Yeah, and but not just him, uh, Danielle Smith. Uh, the, the the list is is actually pretty long. You you know a lot. There there are people who've actually held political office, like uh, Dan, well Stephen Harper, Danielle. Uh, Pierre, but for every one of those, there's another dozen or more people who have followed uh, them to Ottawa uh, or to Edmonton and become senior staffers, either in ministry in the in in the in ministers' offices or in uh, in the civil service. So uh, the Calgary School has had a lot of influence, and I'm, yeah. I'm happy about that. Too. Well, it, it's been good to know uh, many of uh, your colleagues from that school over the years, and. Uh, of course, you you uh, co-opted Ian Brody uh, into the school after he left politics. He's a, you know was an Ontario academic before he he went and tried his hand at being chief of staff to Stephen Harper, and, and then I guess you guys you, know, you, you offered him filthy oil lucre or something and and got him out there. Well, Ian's Ian's an, uh, again a classic example of uh, I think some of the quality of people we've had in the Conservative Party in the last couple of decades. He grew up in he grew up in, in Metro Toronto. He did his undergrad at McGill. He went out to the University of Calgary. You may not know he did his PhD with me at the University. Oh, of I Calgary. didn't know that. And then, yeah, and that's that's where he met uh, Stephen Harper and Tom Flanagan. And then when when Tom went to uh, Ottawa with Stephen, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, Ian first. Then after he left U of C, he went and taught at uh, Western, I think, for four or five years. Uh, but when Flanagan and Harper went off to Ottawa. He went. He went with them, and he was there for a decade. I think he served uh, four or five years then as Canada's representative in Washington, the Council of the Americas, and then uh, Jack Mintz brought him out to Calgary at the, for the School of Public Policy. And so he's he's lived and worked in all parts of uh, Canada and in the U.S. He's a pretty exceptional, smart guy, and I'm I'm glad he's at the University of Calgary now teaching. You've taught some impressive people, uh, Ted. Let me ask you this then, uh, regarding Pierre Polyev. You, you say you've known him a long time, you taught him. Um, people that don't know him, at least this is my experience, but maybe I'm, you know, I've known him since he was first elected, so that's 20 years this past spring. Um, and I've always known him to be an affable guy, you know, someone who cracks a good joke, is willing to laugh, including it himself. But I'm sure you've heard the complaint as well. Oh, he's mean. Oh, he's angry. Um, what's the guy that you know like? And does he have an image problem that he needs to to fix so that people don't think he's just an angry guy yelling off in the corner? Well, again, I go back to the polling that you're aware of and all uh, your listeners are aware of. He's, he's polling way, way ahead of uh, Trudeau and the liberals right now. So a lot of people seem to have changed their mind. Something you just said, which I consider critical uh, in my judgment of people, whether they're conservatives or liberals or ND, whatever, can they laugh at themselves? People who can't laugh at themselves make me nervous, uh, uh, and particularly political leaders who can't laugh at themselves. And uh, um, Pierre is uh, laughs at himself all the time, and if you listen to his speeches, uh, he can he gets people laughing pretty quickly and his wife's even better i think as a pair they're going to be tough to beat and uh and um uh, i think that's reflected that they're normal ordinary canadian you know, she's an immigrant second generation immigrant uh loves canada uh, you know pierre was adopted uh grew up in a bi unilingual by by french parents french family in the west but he grew up in calgary so he's been bilingual fluently bilingual since he was a kid and uh, grew up in Calgary. We knew him in the 90s as a college university student, but he's been in uh, you know, Ottawa MP for almost almost 20 years, yep. right? So he's, he, but he's, he, everything Pierre has, he earned for himself. Everything Justin had was, was handed to him on a platter. And I think, I think Canadians see that, and that's one of the reasons they like him. Well, I, I also know that he's a policy wonk, so he may be one of the people reading your book. <laughs> Um, although he did tell me recently, we were doing an interview and he told me that he's now reading books while listening to the audio book version 
at double or triple speed so he gets through it faster. So you might have to do an audio book uh, for, for him to finish everything. I don't think that's in the cards for me. I- Ted Morton's new book is called Strong and Free. If you're a policy wonk, you will like it. It is out now, available wherever fine books are sold. Ted, thanks so much for the time. Thank you, Brian. I enjoyed our, our talk. Full Comment is a post-media podcast. My name's Brian Lilly, your host. This episode was produced by Andre Pru with theme music by Bryce Hall. Kevin Libin is the executive producer. Remember, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts and you YouTube Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Help us out by giving us a rating, leaving a review, and tell your friends about us. Thanks for listening. Until next time, I'm Brian Lilly. <laughs>